Okay, I think we'll get started. First, I want to welcome you all and say thank you so much for coming and spending some time with us all this morning. These are very strange times. We certainly would have loved to have seen you all in person um, back in the spring, but thanks for bearing with us as we got our bearings and figured out what to do next. Um, we're so glad that you're here today. So I am Brie Williams. I'm one of the co-directors of the Arch Network, along with Nick Zoller, who is, at least on my screen, third down, um, who's a Good professor one. in the College of Public Health. Hi, Nick. Hi. And Sarah Van Zanten, who you all have come to know and love through email, is at least on my screen on the upper left. Go ahead and wave, Sarah. Hey, everyone. Nice to see your faces. And we are the Arch Network Directors. This is, of course, funded by the National Institute of Aging through an R24 grant. So we all come to this, uh, to this area and uh, to this research in a number of different ways, either through personal experience and having been a client in the criminal justice system, to working in the criminal justice system, to researching it from the outside or from the inside as a clinician on the front lines. Because we all come from different perspectives, I'm just gonna run over some very basic um, information for those of you who are new to the field. And for those of you who are, uh, who are well-versed, please bear with me. To, around 2.2 million Americans are incarcerated. An additional 11 million cycle through jails each year and an alarming one in three black men and one in six Latino men experience a lifetime risk of incarceration. And thanks to Emily Wong and her group, we know that incarcerated people of all ages experience a much higher burden of disease on average than the general population does, everything from hypertension and heart disease to diabetes and stroke. But why do we create the ARCH network? Well, as you all know, or at least as you are all very interested in knowing, there's been profound growth in the population of justice system involved older adults over the past three decades, really globally, but especially in the United States. So this is a graph that some of you have seen. Um, this is from 1990 to 2018, when the most recent data were available. And this shows percent growth from 1990 populations to 2018. And what you can see is on the bottom, there's a, a dark blue or black bar that shows the overall US population of people age 55 or older. The um, dotted green line shows the US population overall. And both of those increased at their height around 100%. But obviously neither of those accounts for the red bar, which is the percentage growth from 1990 population to 2018 of people incarcerated in state and federal prisons age 55 or older. And in fact, this year marks a very, or sorry, 2016 marked a very interesting year when the aging population in US state prisons age 55 or older became 12% of the population which meant that the number of older adults then surpassed the number of younger adults. So the age group 18 to 24, which was at 11% of the population, this continues to grow. And a lot of things happen when that population increases. This is a this story back in 2012 from the New York Times. Residents experience extraordinarily high rates of early onset dis disease and disability, so-called accelerated aging, including cognitive impairment and dementia. And the functional requirements of many of the living spaces just don't meet the functional abilities of the population. So this is the famous three bunk living in, an, um, in a converted gym. This actually is from the Department of Corrections in California many years ago before the recent Plata case, not so recent Plata case. So this does not exist anymore in, the, in California, but there is still triple bunk living in many states in the country. And here's another more recent picture of dorm living for um, people with ADA requirements. These are hard places to navigate. And although older adults generate the highest costs and have the lowest risk of recidivism, their health and healthcare needs are profoundly understudied. We know from Dave Eber's um, review of the literature about a year ago uh, that the number of studies of older adults who are incarcerated in prisons or jails is vanishingly small. 
And this is for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons is because researchers like us um, are either isolated geographically from others. Oftentimes people are their only person in their, in their university or even their state interested in this area, or they're intimidated to enter the field. It just feels like overwhelming. And so addressing these knowledge gaps requ requires really a nationwide and even a global research infrastructure. And that's why we're here today. And I just have to mention that obviously this is extraordinarily important always, but during COVID-19, this has really become even more important because the high rates of aging, the extraordinarily high disease burden at baseline, and the overcrowding that we all know exists has really become a public health catastrophe. And as we all know, the top 15 case clusters, in fact, almost all of the top 40 are in correctional facilities. And thanks to our colleagues from the COVID Prison Project, who I believe are on this call as well. As of yesterday, there have been almost 100,000 cases among people incarcerated in prisons, at least those that are publicly reported, at least 851 deaths of incarcerated people. And while many prisons and jails are not actually testing, or at least not reporting testing, we have at least reported 19,340 positive cases among staff and at least 59 deaths including yesterday in California of a staff member. So here we are, and what is the overarching goals of the ARCH Network? Well, it's first of all to bring researchers together from diverse fields such as yourselves, who are dedicated to studying the healthcare needs and experiences of justice-involved older adults and the drivers of later life health disparities in this population. It's second to support new and established researchers in the development and implementation of research in this area, first through mentorship of junior investigators, but also of, of uh, mid-level investigators who are new to the field. Second, by providing funding for pilot and exploratory research, and we'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. And third, opportunities for multidisciplinary research and collaboration and partnerships, including with people with direct experience and with, justice, with the justice system, either as clients or staff, or leaders in correctional systems or places. So we have some process goals, which are to ensure that geriatric principles like functional impairment, cognitive impairment, and geriatric syndromes are front and center in studying the health and healthcare needs of justice-involved older adults, to de develop a transdisciplinary research and research agenda that can inform correctional and community healthcare systems programmatic and policy interventions to reduce health, reduce health disparities, basically so that systems are not developing programs blind and to partner with stakeholders, all stakeholders, to develop and move forward a research agenda that di includes directly impacted people, community leaders, frontline healthcare professionals, policymakers, and when necessary, the press, so that we can communicate what we've found with the general public. So with that quick introduction, I'd like to first tell you a bit about the ARCH Network and what we've done so far and who we are so far. So, First, I'd like to welcome our years one and two executive committee members and advisors. These are um, our more senior faculty member, Lisa Berry, Associate Professor of Psychiatry from the UConn Center on Aging. We have a um, more junior faculty representative, Jennifer James, who's an Assistant Professor in the Institute for Health and Aging at UCSF. And we have a community member and act, an activist leader in the community, Johnny Perez, uh, who's the Director of the US Prisons Program National Ca Religious Campaign Against Torture, or NORCAT. Sorry, NORCAT. So who are we? We are already 133 network members and growing um, across eight countries, the US, obviously, Australia, Belgium, Canada, England, France, Ireland, and Switzerland, multiple states. We are from 71 different affiliations, everything from the AARP, and the ACLU uh, to Howard University, the Correctional Service of Canada, from New York University School of Medicine to Stanford and Trinity College to the Rhode Island Department of Corrections, the University of Louisville, where apparently they have a marmot problem. <laughs> That's Stephanie and Yale. We have lots of interests, and this, these are based on the results from the Arch Network database survey that you all responded to, and thank you so much. Everything from black feminist theory and cognitive, dementia, cognitive decline dementia, to federal sentencing guidelines and geriatric neuropsychology, 
from the law and ethics of dementia in prisons to palliative and hospice care, to reentry planning, veterans health and women's health. So what have you all said that you want from the ARCH network? Well, first you've said that you want us to support developing multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary research collaborations. You want regular updates on the state of the science and work in the field. You want notice of funding opportunities and knowledge about other members' contributions to city, state, or national policy reforms. So I'm gonna tell you a bit about year one, which obviously has been a bit strange because of the recent events, but uh, we have done our best to respond to your needs so far, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our plans for how to respond to them in the coming years. So first, we just launched a monthly newsletter, thanks to Sarah. Our plan for the monthly newsletter is that we'll include information announcements, everything from funding opportunities and recent publications by network members to calls for papers, upcoming professional development seminars, which I'll talk about a little bit in a moment, and justice system related reforms and policy updates regarding older adults or people with serious illness. We will be profiling network members and collaborations or collaborations that are um, of interest each month. So please send us all the news that you want us to share sarah.vanzanten at ucsf.edu. In the beginning of the year, we funded eight pilot and exploratory grant funding um, program projects. And uh, we actually used the money that we didn't use on our in-person meeting to fund several more than we had expected to. Our goal is to turn all the money that we get around um, to as much extent as possible and back into our members' hands. So, Dr. Arias, who is studying the ethical examination of sentencing decisions and treatment of inmates with dementia. Dr. Emerson, sexual health and aging, or the SAGE study. Drs. Fami and Testa, health among older adults with incarcerated family members. Dr. Kit Lewis, end of life planning and corrections. Dr. Nwaiwu, um, health disparity among incarcerated older adults in Arkansas. Drs. Nowinski and Prost, Correctional service, Health Services for Older Adults, and Dr. Prost on her own, a relationship between visitation and health in older adults who are incarcerated, and Dr. Seeds, Beyond the Hospice, Understanding Why Elderly Prisoners Decline Residents in Hospice and the Capacity of Other Penal Institutions to Care for Them. You all have also been very busy. This is just a small sample of the multiple transdisciplinary articles that have been published through the Art Network collaborations this year. Uh, prisons and COVID-19, a desperate call for gerontological experience in correctional health care, a call to protect patients, correctional staff, and healthcare professionals in jails and prisons during COVID-19, improving care for the overlooked in oncology, incarcerated patients, strategies to optimize the use of compassionate release from U.S. prisons, and protecting decarcerated populations in the era of COVID-19, priorities for emergency discharge planning. And as I said, this is just a selection. So a few activities to look forward to in year two. Again, these monthly newsletters. Um, we will be issuing another call for pilot awards probably in January. Um, we'll be moving into working groups, which will launch today and meet virtually every other month or thereabouts. And we will be starting a professional development and seminar series, basically learning from each other in the network and also guest speakers. So examples will include navigating the IRB and justice system research, consenting participants who are incarcerated, creating a community advisory board, following research participants into the community after release, conducting policy-driven research, and writing an op-ed. So if you have interest in hosting one of these, or, in, um, or if you have an idea about what you'd like to hear about, again, please get in touch with me, Nick, or Sarah at any time. So a little bit on the working groups, and you've already heard a little bit, but I just want to review this. And again, these are the nuts and bolts of what are happening, what's happening today. So these will be uh, today and every other month, obviously virtual. Um, in part, we're planning for the Health and Justice Journal. Uh, Nick has successfully engaged the Health and Justice Journal to publish a special issue about aging and serious illness and justice system involvement. And uh, our goal is that each group uh, will submit one or multiple publication manuscripts for evaluation for publication by spring 2021. So the working groups that we have thus far, but of course we can always have more or we can merge groups, are Compassionate Release Elder Parole Medical Parole, and thank you to network members uh, 
Dr. Brinkley, Rubenstein, and James for hosting that one. Palliative Care and Hospice, Drs. Kit Lewis and Oladero. Uh, mental Health and Substance Use Disorder, uh, Nick Zoller and Ned Morris. Reentry and Transitional Healthcare, Monica Williams and Ben Howell. The Epidemiology of Chronic Disease, Dementia, and Functional Impairment, Drs. Azhar and Arias. And Measures and Methods, Lisa Berry and Tone Tran. So again, thank you so much. The network is very much us, who we are, and what we want to share with each other. So we're really looking forward to, um, to those work groups and seeing what can come from them. So a little bit about today's plans. Uh, sorry, yes, today's plans. Um, in the work group, we'll introduce ourselves, and this is really a chance for us to talk more about ourselves and to get to know each other in smaller groups. Again, the goal is to have at least one manuscript ready for the health and justice call in spring 2021. You can do anything from reviewing the state of the science to talking about knowledge gaps, a research agenda, needs assessment, systematic review, a scoping review, best practices, even a case study. And these can also be data-driven. If somebody in the group has a data source or knows of a data source that can be used for collaboration. But I really encourage you to ask questions. And the most important question that you can ask in these small groups is who's not in the group who's not represented, whose voice will help you. We are an NIH funded group. And so our, um, official, um, our official call is to engage researchers from academic institutions from across the nation. But we certainly don't know what all the problems are. Um, and the most important thing that we can do is engage multiple stakeholders and bring multiple people into the fold of research and community engaged research to make sure that we're asking the right questions and that we're interpreting the evidence in the right way to be of the most help to the people who are in the, in the criminal justice system and the people who work there. So when you realize whose voice is not in your group, please think carefully about how you will reach out to them, how will you involve them, and if you don't know how, who are you gonna ask for help? So I'm almost finished. Uh, today's agenda and guests um, at 8.45 or thereabouts, uh, our program officer, Dr. Melissa Gerald, will speak a bit about NIA funding priorities and where justice, the justice system, aging and serious illness can come into play there. At around 9.15, we'll have our first panel, which is the Stakeholder Perspectives Panel on Important Areas for Research in Aging, Serious Illness, and Criminal Justice Involvement. And we'll be delighted to welcome Dr., uh, Mr. Maurice Chama from the, from the Marshall Project, Dr. Owen Murray, Medical Director of the UT, the University of Texas Medical Branch Correctional Managed Care Program. Uh, Attorney Mary Price, who is uh, the extraordinary leader of FAM, Families Against Mandatory Minimums. And Mr. Stanley Richards, who is a friend and uh, directs the Fortune Society. At 10 a.m., we will then divide into the small groups. And just to give you a preview of what's next in September 2021, uh, we, will, we do not have a date quite yet, but we will launch our next meeting, which will include the first of our seminar series, and we'll be asking some of our pilot awardees to present works in progress in small groups. Um, that's really funny that I said September 2021. I meant September 2020. Um, we wouldn't be much of a network if we waited another year to have the next meeting. Um, and we thought we'd just open it up for any questions or thoughts. Um, for a few minutes, and um, if there are none, we can move into our next into our next guest. But um, thought we'd open it up a little bit. Don't be shy. And if Hi. no one has a oh, sorry, go ahead. Yes. Hi, I'm Gohar. Uh, I would like to hear from caregivers of older incarcerated people. Great. They already experience a lot of stress, but the caregivers of these people and how they're dealing with it, the children or the spouses, the caregivers. Outstanding. Just looking at this group, I know a lot of people uh, have a lot of experience with that. See Mary Price nodding, Michelle De Thomas, Stanley. Anybody else, any other thoughts? I do, hi everyone. Hi. So if anyone has any tips for responding to IRB request changes in light of COVID-19, 
So if there's language that you found to be helpful in modifying your IRB applications, that would be helpful because I've noticed that's coming up. So um, specific questions about how will you attend to COVID-19 concern, concerns um, as you're collecting data, those kinds of things. Absolutely. Maybe we can try to put that in for the September meeting. If somebody's interested in talking about that, let me know, otherwise we'll find somebody. Any other thoughts or questions? And if not, I'd love it if our executive team, uh, Lisa and Jennifer and Johnny could each introduce themselves and just say a quick hello. Sure, I'm happy to say hi. Hi, I'm Lisa Berry. I'm Associate Professor at the University of Connecticut uh, in Psychiatry and the Center on Aging. Um, my research largely focuses on mental health in the correction system with, with older adults, clearly. Um, and I've been collaborating both with Bree and with Amy Byers, who's another investigator somewhere on this call uh, at UCSF, um, looking at issues related to reentry um, using large, large data sets to try to figure out um, how incarceration is associated with suicidal, it, how return to the community after incarceration is associated with uh, depression, suicidal outcomes, and how the healthcare system can perhaps intervene with some of that. Thank you. Uh, Jen, you on, are you on here? Yes, hi. Hi. hi everyone, I'm Jen James. Um, I'm an assistant professor at UCSF in the Institute for Health and Aging and also in uh, the program in bioethics. I'm a sociologist and a qualitative researcher and I do black feminist research. Um, my training is in medical sociology specifically and I have a background in social work and I'm somewhat new um, to this world, sort of just gotten into it in the last, in the last couple of years. Um, and my research is really interested in the uh, experiences of older women and um, with chronic illness, specifically with cancer, because that's what most of my background has been. So I'm excited to be here. Thank you. And Johnny. Uh, thanks so much, Bree. Hello, everyone. My name is Johnny Perez. I work as director of U.S. Prison Programs for uh, the National Religious Campaign Against Torture. In that role, I work with people who are directly impacted by uh, solitary confinement specifically, and also faith leaders. Uh, I myself spent 13 years in prison, uh, three of those years in solitary confinement. And how I met Bree is that we actually both sit uh, uh, our organizations and, and we both sit on the, um, on the steering committee of the Unlock the Box campaign, uh, which is a national movement spanning 14 different states to end the torture of solitary confinement. Last year, we had 78 pieces of legislation introduced around the country. We're making some changes. Uh, I'm, you know, right now it's been, the focus has been around COVID and how COVID is being used as a containment strategy. Excuse me, as solitary is being used as a containment strategy for COVID. Um, and of course, all of the ramifications around that. So very honored to be here sharing space with you all and to just really emphasize the importance of this work coming from someone who um, has been on the other side of this work. Thank you all. Thanks so much for being here and being part of our executive committee, Johnny. No, you're very busy. Um, and actually asking you shall receive because uh, Michelle DeThomas, again, who's on here and is the medical director and has been the medical director for, I don't know, 10 or 15 years at, uh, in the California hospice, says that she has an incredible hospice caregiver who is getting out sometime this month or in the next couple months and she thinks would be a phenomenal um, person to speak on our panel. So when he is feeling ready and up to it, um, we will be excited to welcome him on as uh, maybe on a caregiver panel. I think that that's a fantastic idea. Any other thoughts or questions, um, ideas or concerns? Or if you just want to introduce yourself, I'd say we have about five minutes and then we can uh, take a couple minute break and then we'll hear from uh, Dr. Gerald. Clearly we need a discussion question with a prize. <laughs> okay, good. No, I would, uh, I have something to, to add, yeah. Brie. I mean, I'm just uh, really excited to have this network begin. I think, um, you know, getting, as you mentioned earlier, getting involved in corrections related research is so, is challenging for many reasons. And I think, uh, you know, I have many, medical students, for example, or uh, junior faculty who are often 
interested in, in pursuing something related um, in the correction system, but yet there's so many deterrents to, to doing so in regard to IRB and just establishing relationships, just the, the distrust in the correction system. So I'm, I'm really excited uh, that this network is, is here now to help encourage research across the country and make it easier for, hopefully easier, um, for people to, to get involved in research like this, um, because it, it shouldn't be this hard. And as, as some of your papers have shown, um, so many people are left out of, you know, very important health-related studies, um, community data, because they're incarcerated, and uh, it's such an important part of the population to include. Uh, you know, the most vulnerable are being left out of a lot of this data that policy decisions are being made on. So I'm, I'm really excited and encouraged about, about the ARCH network. So thank you. Thanks so much. And you should all feel really free to get in touch with any of us. Um, we're all here because we all want this research area to move forward in a very real way. And Brie, can I just add something to this? this is Amy, and, and I, I collaborate with, with uh, Lisa, and I, you know, I'm at UCSS, UCSF also, and I'm an epidemiologist, and I never thought about doing work. I, I mean, I come from an aging epi background and late life mental health. I never realized I'd be doing, you know, doing some work on reentry, veterans, older adults, and when Lisa and I initially thought about our idea was at a, I think it was at GSA or one of the conference, it was one of the conferences we were at in terms of just thinking about big data and I use big data and Lisa's work in, in prisoners and your work, Bree. And I honestly am really like, my heart is like in this now. Like it's, it's interesting. I never thought I'd be here right now. Um, and so I think in, it, it took me realizing the importance of this work and realizing that because it was so foreign to me. I'm like, that's behind another scene. That's not what I do. And um, it does really interface with what I do. And I didn't realize how much until I started working with, with Lisa. And then just now, you know, realizing all that your work that you've done and how it is a part of the work I do. So thank you. And I, I'm really happy to be a part of this and to learn more. Um, I mean, just the, the things we've learned about the policy issues, the healthcare issues of when they're inside and when people come outside. It's just, it's mind boggling to me, all the problems and issues. So I'm glad we're able to come together and unify, unify as a group. I think we're stronger. Yeah, I would like to say uh, I'm new too. And now I'm very excited to be part of this because this is very new to me. But I would like to suggest that we have a movie night or a movie day because those of us who are not familiar with what it is like, what the surroundings or inside of a prison is like, we can only learn through, uh, you know, we can learn in, in a fast way by watching pertinent movies uh, with, uh, with, with good, uh, with, you know, some of them are based on real life and we are so privileged to have Johnny with us here, um, uh, because he has actually experienced it and, uh, his insight would be so, so, so valuable for us. Um, uh, and we are honored and privileged to have him, but those of us who don't have the experience of, um, of prisons in America or in other parts of the world. We need a junior people and all of us can learn a little bit through movies. So maybe one day can be devoted to that or half a day can be devoted to that. And then, uh, then there can be a discussion afterwards. Thank you for that, Isaiah. Just really quickly, I'll say, and we're now checking with Brie about this, but you know, uh, 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 you know, think of me also as a resource, you know? When you, you know, as you as you as you engage in this work, it is very important and critical to your point that you do involve people who've been directly impacted by the areas and issues that you're all going to be working on. Because if not, then you're just going to miss the mark and spin the wheels, and it's, it's a bunch of other things <laughs> that go with that. But um, uh, in addition to a movie, you know, if if this group or folks feel that 
it's probably be, you know, useful to, in addition to that to talk to people who have those different experiences in your different areas. And I'm also helping to, you know, to, to, to help organize that and put that on again. I'll check with the rest of the team. But if there are things like that that will be helpful to the group and to the network, you know, um, I'm personally here for as, as a resource, but also I think we can uh, talk about it, you know, amongst the, the executive group and, and make that available. There are people, um, instead of watching the movies that the movie, that, the, that you know, that, that these movies are made of, actually talking to these folks directly and they'll tell you um, exactly what that is and actually have your questions responded to and things like that. And I do have some basic movie suggestions that people can watch, like 13 and things like that, but um, mm -hmm. totally happy to actually organize real people to have that conversation. I, I could I could make a comment um, um, from the Department of Veterans Affairs, Keith McInnes. Um, I came kind of in, into this interest through my work in homelessness and um, kind of seeing that in the, the population I was interested in and, and trying to gain better access to a substantial number had um, you know, histories of incarceration. Uh, so that's just another area I think of intersection that that this group could think about. And um, I, I think there are quite a number of colleagues in the VA who have interest in homelessness who probably, um, if, if they thought about it more, would realize uh, the importance of this uh, population as well that, that this group is interested in. Standing, the VA in, uh, in the US really has had some extraordinary programs. Um, that have that have led the way. They had programs when no one else had them, um, especially around reentry. So also just knowing a little bit more about the history of the VA programs and what they can teach us would be helpful as well. Hi, this is Monica Williams. I have a really quick question. Um, I've listened to and I see a ton of people that I want to get to know better, um, and we may not all be in the same working groups. Will we have access to contact information once this call is over? Yes, and so uh, everybody who is willing, that's one of our announcements at the end, but everybody who is willing to be um, contacted, um, we'll, we will email everybody who is part of this call and ask if it's okay with you if we put your information on a contact list. In addition, we actually have 133 people who have already signed up. And only about 80 or 70 people were able to come today or RSVP for today and will be coming in and out. And so we'll also ask the other, you know, 50 people who uh, were not available today, okay. whether or not they're willing to be on that list as well. Also, this is uh, not an invitation only group. So, you know, there's nothing to stop it from being a thousand people. <laughs> like just anybody that you know who is interested, who has a personal experience of working or living in prisons, of um, studying prisons, or is interested in the possibility of extending their work um, to study prisons or criminal justice involvement in any way, shape, or form, please let them know about us. Where the the unifying characteristic is aging, serious illness, and research, and um, everybody is invited. And uh, we're just we're glad you guys are the guinea pigs. A any other questions or thoughts or marmots as as Stephanie might, might talk about. Um, yeah. Can I just, one thing? Yes, go ahead. I just want to build on some, um, one of the comments that was made earlier by Johnny, uh, and thank you so much for uh, your participation, Johnny, because that's uh, really honored to hear the, the things that you have to say. In Canada, there's a bit of um, a discourse around the importance of including the voices of those who are directly impacted by the research and policies that are uh, developed by various organizations in social policy and such, uh, specifically like uh, those with mental health issues, uh, the, uh, the elderly uh, in uh, long-term care and in uh, correctional institutions, and also people of uh, um, indigenous peoples, First Nations peoples in our country, making sure that they're consulted at the front end before going into any of these type of projects. Now, I think that that's sort of a, a, a no-brainer, is something that everyone quite understands. and. Uh, and when, if we can increase the participation of those individuals in our consultations when we're developing research programs and such, that'd be wonderful. On the other hand, uh, we also, I think, is important that when we develop materials uh, and uh, start putting out research, uh, research materials or our findings into the press or whatever it might be, that we clearly state what the, impl what the intended implications of these would be in policy. Um, in Canada, at least from my experience, 
uh, it's all too often to have research done by people who have certain intentions in mind of where this could lead, and then it being kind of appropriated by systems that then use it uh, for other ends and to justify other ends uh, that are not, not in line with what the intended purpose was. So just some. I'm gonna reach out to you when we have our um, session on policy-oriented research because that's a huge question in policy-oriented research. When you take up a question and the findings there, you have to think about the unintended consequences of your findings as well um, when you shape them and bring them out into the world. So uh, if you don't mind, you're gonna be, you're gonna be tapped, Ahmad. 